right, I'm going to read just three verses, verses that were very important to Calvin and on which he really based his whole life. Uh, it's the last verse of Revelation, Romans 11 and the first two of Romans 12. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to, by the mercies of God, that ye would that you present your bodies a, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect gift of God. Let's pray. Lord, we ask thy benediction upon this address that we may learn from thy grace in the life of John Calvin and that practical lessons may flow from this address that we can use in our own daily and spiritual lives. Please help us now and use us even in these moments for good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, John Calvin did the work of 10 men live the life of 10 men, to put someone's arms around his life and legacy and embrace the lessons to be learned from both is next to impossible, even for a major treatise, much less one small address. Modern history often does not realize how dependent it is especially Western civilization, on the thinking of John Calvin. It's not just church and theology and missions and worship, but education, government, economics, industry, social work, that all bears the imprint of Calvin's thought. And consequently, many people have thought in church history that Calvin was one of the greatest minds and one of the greatest influences of Western civilization ever. The 19th century historian William Cunningham said, Calvin was by far the greatest of the reformers. He's the man who next to Paul has done most for mankind. Charles Spurgeon is even stronger. Among all men born of women, there has not risen a greater than John Calvin. No age before him ever produced his equal and no age after him ever afterwards has seen his rival. The longer I live, the clearer does it appear that Calvin's system of doctrine is the nearest to perfection. As a result, the English scholar, Lord John Morley said, to omit John Calvin from the forces of Western civilization is to read history with one eye shut. And yet, as much as Calvin has been loved and appreciated, so much has he been hated and despised. The Lutheran historian, and Lutherans generally don't take too well to Calvinists. I had personal experience with that. Louis Spitz writes, Calvin was one of those strong and consistent men of history who people either liked or disliked, adored or abhorred. The historian Will Durant said, we shall always find it hard to love the man Calvin who darkened the human soul with the most absurd and blasphemous conception of God in all the long and honored history of Christianity. Astonishing words. As far as Calvin himself, he was so self-effacing that, as we heard already, he seldom wrote about himself, didn't want a memorial stone, and just simply wanted to live in the spirit of Romans eleven thirty six through Romans 12, 2. Of him and through him and to him be all the glory. Therefore, I will use my entire soul, mind, and body to render service to him. Well, John Calvin was born in uh, Nouillon in France, northeastern France, in 1509, the inhabitants of Nuwayon celebrated in 1551 when a rumor reached their ears 
that Kelvin had died. The following year, uh, Nguyen was actually destroyed, the entire city, by the Germans. And Kelvin wrote, rather wryly, that he outlived the rumors of his death and outlived Nguyen itself. And remarkably, the only home that was left standing in Nguyen was his parents' home, in which Kelvin had been brought up. And Kelvin seems to just barely intimate without asserting it definitively that perhaps it is a miracle from God. Uh, Theodore Beza said of Kelvin that his parents were widely respected and in comfortable circumstances. Kelvin's father expected him to go into the priesthood and encouraged him. And so in 1520, a young Calvin, uh, 1521 perhaps, at the age of 11 or 12, was sent to Paris to prepare for the priesthood. And that involved taking the arts course at the University of Paris, plus nine years of study for a doctorate in theology. By the mid-1520s, Calvin, still a teenager then, mastered the arts course. He had become an excellent scholar, particularly in Latin and philosophy, when his plans suddenly crashed. His dad decided he should go into law rather than into priesthood, against Calvin's own wishes. But Calvin was an obedient son, and his dad said, you should go to Orléans to study law for two reasons. First, because his dad, Gerard, said, you'll make much more money because he himself had been studying some law and was doing quite well financially than if you become a priest. But secondly, and more importantly, Gerard had a falling out with the Roman Catholic clergy and they actually excommunicated him. He felt wrongfully because he handled the estate of two priests in a way that the church did not find acceptable. And so this sudden dramatic change of profession for young Calvin was uh, really something that was overwhelming for him. But he trained in law for several years. And uh, like Paul, who was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, God used that later on in Kelvin's life, so that he acquired in his mind a great abilities of clarity and precision and caution. And that served him later on in his life in a variety of areas, such as uh, Bible commentaries and, and theology and church polity and education and the threefold use of the moral law that was developed in such a a lawyer-like way, uh, civil and criminal law, public morality, legal questions, opinions, social welfare, all the questions that came to him from people about all kinds of issues, Christian liberty, family relationships, church-state relationships. Calvin learned from his law studies things that would help him in all of these areas and no doubt more. But secondly, his university training in law was very helpful to him because there he met uh, Professor Walmar, who was an evangelical, who had embraced the Reformed faith and who began teaching Greek to Calvin and no doubt shared his faith with Calvin. And it's hard to estimate how much influence he had on Calvin, but no doubt it was fairly substantial because he was very close to Calvin. And he was instrumental in teaching Calvin the great riches of the New Testament. Now, it was about that time, when Calvin was perhaps 23 or 24, that he was suddenly converted. And the only place he writes about that is in his preface to the commentary on the Psalms. And the reason he does it there is because he says, I, I count myself to have been able to identify with every experience the psalmist has gone through. 
and therefore I am actually qualified to be an exegete of the Psalms. And at that point, Calvin then reminisces about himself, and he says, To the pursuit of the study of law, I endeavored faithfully to apply myself in obedience to the will of my Father. But God, by the secret guidance of his providence, at length gave a different direction to my course. At first, since I was too obstinately devoted to the superstition of popery, to be easily extricated from so profound an abyss of mire, He's referring here to the fact that his mother took him regularly to the Roman Catholic Church, and he says, I, I so imbibed as a boy the superstitions of popery that it was hard for me to, to switch to Protestantism. God, by a sudden conversion, subdued and brought my mind to a teachable frame, which was more hardened in such matters than might have been expected from one at so early a period of life as me. Having thus received some taste and knowledge of true godliness, I was immediately inflamed with so intense a desire to make progress therein, that although I did not altogether leave off my other studies, I yet pursued them with less ardor. So Calvin drops his superstitions about popery, and he searches for God, ascribes his rescue to God alone. And in this paragraph where he describes his conversion, it's interesting he makes no mention of Walmart or of other, other uh, people who had a big influence in his life. He really gives it all to the glory of God. And he calls his conversion sudden, unexpected. It's not the result of anything of Calvin himself. It is God intervening of him and through him and to him are all things. To him alone be the glory. And God does this suddenly, Calvin says, despite my natural stubbornness. He even recognized that his, his character was a bit stubborn. But God subdued me, he says, and brought my mind into a teachable frame. That's a very important expression for Calvin because he's all his life talking about the importance of, of being brought into a teachable frame to receive the word of God unequivocally and to bow under it unreservedly. And God has done that for him. And Calvin is so inspired, you see, by this uh, sudden conversion that it overrode his interest in law. And he, he hankers again after, after studying theology. But out of respect for his father, he still does not immediately drop out of law school. But he studies law with less ardor, he says. Now that, we can learn from all of this, lesson number one. And lesson number one is that in between all the lines of Calvin's conversion, you can read this. The Holy Spirit overcame me. God did the work. God, the Holy Ghost, worked in my soul. And so the agency of the Holy Spirit figures prominently in Calvin's heart and in all of his theology. And that's something beautiful, something we need to learn, that the Holy Spirit is operative in anything, any good desire. Your entire religion, my friend, is a sham without the Holy Spirit. And Calvin realizes that. In fact, Historians have called him the theologian in church history of the Holy Spirit. We are constantly dependent on the Spirit for any good that could ever flow from us. Now, Calvin has this unreserved, wholehearted commitment to the living God for the rest of his life. He would pledge allegiance to God with every ounce of energy for the rest of his life to serve the glory of God. Hermann Selderheis writes in his fantastic, recent, uh, masterful volume, biography, just called John Calvin, which he drew entirely, he told me personally, from the letters of Calvin, which is a fascinating way to do biography. Selderheist writes this, 
Calvin became God's advocate. He would de devote every minute of the rest of his life to the defense of God and to his cause. And it's this ardent commitment of Calvin that is so real in his life that drew around him so many God-fearing people, that bonded him so deeply with, with great friendships with the God-fearing. This, this unabated zeal that is carried out so vividly in his motto for life, my heart I give thee, Lord, promptly and sincerely, or sometimes translated eagerly and earnestly. This leads us to lesson number two the beauty and the power of a life wholly surrendered to God is unspeakable. This is the hallmark of John Calvin's exemplary life. And oh, that it would be ours as well. I had a parishioner many, many times I prayed with him and visits and I asked him to pray once, I'd pray once and he'd always end his prayer this way. Lord, help me to live holy and solely, holy and solely for Jesus Christ. Well, that was Calvin. And would to God, it would be every one of us. Now, Calvin comes to Geneva. In less than a year after his conversion, Calvin is already very involved with some of the leading reformers. He finds that his evangelical faith is dangerous in France, and he's soon forced to flee because of persecution. He goes to Basel, where we were, in 1535, in January. And while there, he begins working already on the institutes of the Christian religion. He's a fairly new convert. But that would then, of course, later on become a great classic, as, as you heard before. After a year or so at Basel, he moves on to Italy. He wanted to live there permanently as an obscure scholar, but for one reason or another, it didn't work out very well, and he returned to France. But he could only stay in France no more than six months, because the edict of uh, 1536 says, we allow heretics to live in the kingdom on the condition that they are reconciled to Rome within six months. So to avoid imprisonment, Calvin had to leave France, or Rome rather, as well. Uh, leave, it, leave France as well. So he, he goes to, he plans to go to Strasbourg here to gain some support from Martin Bucer. But on the way, as we heard, and I won't, I won't repeat all those details, uh, the road is closed. He has to pass through Geneva and Pharrell lays hold of him. And uh, Kelvin says, after Pharrell pronounces his curse upon him, uh, these words, finding that he gained nothing by entreaties, Pharrell proceeded to utter an imprecation upon me if I should withdraw and refuse to give him assistance. And Kelvin then adds, finding as if God had come from heaven and laid his mighty hand upon me as to arrest me, I could do no otherwise. So Calvin agrees to stay in Geneva without any promise of remuneration or anything. He just feels it's God's will and he wants to be in the circle of God's will. Which leads me to lesson number three, that we must always be living in the circle of God's will. And God will make that will also our desire at due time, sometimes sooner, sometimes later. But when we are living in the will of God, when we know we're doing what God wants us to do and we're where God wants us to be, there's an inward peace in our soul that nothing else can give. That's what Kelvin knows. He knows even though it won't be easy in Geneva, he has to be in Geneva. First ministry in Geneva. Calvin almost immediately begins to serve as a lecturer, commencing with exegete 
exegeting the epistles of Paul, and he soon also appointed as a pastor in Geneva as well, within the first year. Both of which seemed to me with instantaneous considerable success. Nevertheless, Calvin's first ministry in Geneva becomes very problematic. There's uh, dissensions in the city. Many of the leaders are opposed to him on one side. Uh, some of the Anabaptists are opposed to him on the other side. And so the city council is a majority of them really are not in favor of Calvin. And so early on, Calvin concludes that if Geneva is to become thoroughly reformed, the church needs a confession to which all the citizens in Geneva should subscribe. He's also convinced that the discipline of errant church members should be taken away from the state, the city council, and should be given to the church. But that makes the city council all the more opposed to him because, well, who, who knows, these, uh, these uh, preachers in town, these foreign preachers who've come in, Pharrell and Calvin, they might be unstable. Who knows, they might even excommunicate one of us city councilmen because they're pretty godly men and have pretty high expectations. So they resist. And eventually, within a two-year period, they start talking about getting rid of Calvin and Pharrell. And when Calvin and Pharrell insist on excommunicating a few members of the church who were living in sin before Easter 1538, the city council is severely opposed to that. One of the ones they're going to discipline is actually a relative to one of the city council members. And uh, they absolutely tell Calvin and Pharrell they must not do that. And so Calvin and Pharrell obey, but they feel then that they can't have the Lord's Supper because things aren't right in the church. And that's the last straw for the city council. And they tell them, you must leave. Geneva for insubordination. And Calvin leaves Geneva with mixed emotions. He writes this to a friend, Geneva is bound on my heart so fully I would gladly give my entire life for its welfare. But in the next breath he says, my master's will be done. If we had served men, we would have been ill rewarded, but we serve a good master who will reward us even in expulsion. Lesson number four, let us remember that God's sovereign ways with us, which teach us to fear his name, to esteem his smiles above the smiles of men and his frowns above the frowns of men. Let us remember that that submission to the fear of God is worth more than any adversity we have to go through. Whatever the adversity, if it brings that fruit, it is well with our soul. And Calvin's entire life seems to be permeated with the value of this fear. We talked about that the other day at the beginning of our trip. Remember about piety, pietas, which was really the fear of God. This is at the heart of John Calvin and his theology. Calvin in Strasbourg. Calvin wanted then to go to Basel, as you know, but he heeds Martin Bucer's pressing invitation to take the leadership of the French-speaking congregation, refugee congregation, of 500 souls. And I, I don't know about your group, but we were able to find that church this afternoon, and that was a huge blessing to just be there. And Calvin pastors this congregation for three years, the most pleasant years, he would tell a friend later, of his life, the happiest years. And that brings me to lesson number five. Let us be aware that sometimes God blesses us greatly through providences that we don't desire, but then brings our lines to fall in pleasant places. Sometimes the very things that we think are working most against us, God turns on their head so that we see in them and through them that he does exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So what God does for Calvin is he gives him some very pleasant years, not only, but he also gives Martin Bootser as his mentor and uses Bootser to mature Calvin in several different ways of church leadership 
as we saw earlier in one of our talks, so that Calvin can go back a second time to Geneva and run his leadership efforts there much more maturely, much more biblically, much more effectively than ever before. So God has ways of dealing with us that we can't see ahead of time, that fit us for positions uh, later that bring him the glory. Now, that brings me then to a sixth lesson that we must remember as Butzer was used so much for Calvin that we ought to have mentors in our lives. When we see wiser, older Christians, do what you can to treasure those friendships and to, to ask advice and questions. Uh, I've tried to do that all my life, actually, of older ministers. William Young, for example, died a few years ago. He was 96, and I, I, I met him out in Rhode Island when he was uh, just after his 96th birthday, and I was like 60. Uh, but I still said to him, Dr. Young, could you tell me, as, as, as a younger minister, could you tell me, what, what would you say if you were to give me advice as a minister? And he sat there, he's all hunched up in his wheelchair, I'll never forget it. And he's thinking for about a minute. And then he looks up at me and he gives me this warm smile and he says, love Jesus and preach him. This is the man who's a great philosopher, a great theologian. Love Jesus and preach him. So simple, so beautiful. Well, Calvin, you see, learned so much from Butzer, and we can learn so much from other people who've gone the path before us. Now, in, in Strasbourg, as we heard also, I believe on the bus, most of you anyway, Calvin meets Idolette de Bure, who he will marry and have nine precious, wonderful years with. And said he never had one argument with her. She never stood in the way of one event of ministry. She never gave me the least hindrance, he said. And if I could walk to eternity in anyone's shoes other than my own, it would be hers. That brings me to lesson number seven, the priority of looking for a God-fearing spouse who treasures biblical and spiritual maturity and reflects them most of all. What a difference a God-fearing spouse can make in our lives. It's immeasurable, and it's so critical that we put at the very forefront of our marital lives or of looking for a spouse the tender fear of God that Edelet had, and the spirit of servanthood and kindness that she exemplified. The nine years that they had together were not easy years, not unclouded years. Calvin's letters are full of references to Edelet's various illnesses throughout their short marriage. The three children that they were privileged to have, or two and perhaps one miscarriage, it's a little debatable there, all were lost in infancy. One died at 22 days after birth. One died at a tad bit older. But the Roman Catholics viewed Calvin's inability to have children as an act of God's judgment against him. Calvin's response, I have myriads of spiritual children all over the world of whom ye know not of. When Edelet died, Calvin wrote this to a friend, I am no more now but a half a man. And not even half a man, since God recently took my dear wife home to himself. I am forced to go on, but I hardly have the courage to do so. Lesson number eight. Let us learn from Calvin how to bear suffering and heartbreak, turning it over to God. And though the heartbreak is real, the suffering is real, to persevere in commending ourselves entirely to God. Calvin's second ministry in Geneva, 1541 to the end of his life, 1564. By 1541, you heard from Dr. Haken, the Roman Catholics were beginning to recoup 
in Geneva, and they commissioned a cardinal named Sadaletto to write a public letter to the Genevans, pleading with them to come back to the Roman Catholic fold. And the Genevan town council can't find anyone of a caliber to answer that, so they appeal to Calvin, and Calvin writes a masterful response, reply to Sadaletto. And uh, one of the earliest, best summaries of the Reformed Church's doctrinal position. And uh, they call Calvin back, therefore, to continue this battle. And Calvin goes back, not because he wanted to leave Strasbourg, but because he felt a sense that he was needed in Geneva, that God was calling him back. It was a personal call. And that, too, is a lesson in itself, isn't it? That we are where God fits our gifts and fits them to needs. That is an indication, Calvin would say, of God's call, where need and gift come together. But most people don't realize Calvin didn't have an easy time when he went back the second time either. Scholars divide those 24 years into two periods, years of opposition and years of support. And the first 15 of those 24 years are years of opposition. Calvin is successful in those 15 years to bring about some church reforms, uh, but none of that came easily. It was through many battles, through much opposition, and uh, eventually uh, his ecclesiastical ordinances are begrudgingly accepted by the town council, in which he clearly defines what the church should be. He sets out four offices, ministers, what he calls doctors, those are theological teachers, elders, and deacons. Calvin interprets Ephesians 4, uh, treating the doctor office as separate from the pastoral office, though they often doubled up. The pastors and doctors formed a group called the Venerable Company, which met for weekly Bible study, which Calvin moderated and presented its recommendations to the city council. And the pastors and elders met in a body called the consistory once a week to provide pastoral counsel, to censor uh, immoral conduct, and to draw in new members. The deacons also met every week to carry out their tasks for the poor. And alongside that church structure, the city formed a pyramid of three councils that included the smallest the most powerful council of 24 people, 24 men, usually called the city council, and the larger, less powerful city council of 60, and another one of 100 men. And so these two bodies, or these three city bodies, and the four church offices, that all had to be worked out together in Calvin's thinking, as well as in the civic side of Geneva. And so that caused some tensions as well. Now, throughout the 40s, in the first half of the 50s, Kelvin, even though he wasn't always successful, his moral authority in the hearts of the councilmen was growing through his preaching, his teaching, and his wisdom. But even then, the city council often operated against Kelvin's judgment. At the same time, Calvin had battles with several men. I, will, I won't trouble you with all their names. Uh, four or five of them, not just Servetus, but four or five others, who attacked him from all sides in writing, spread terrible rumors about him, falsehoods, uh, uh, spread uh, allegations that cost Calvin uh, lots of time and energy. He often had to write back to defend himself uh, in various books and treatises. And despite all this opposition from the city council and from these various individuals, uh, theologians, laymen, Calvin persevered, preaching seven times a week on an average, twice on a Sunday, at one of the two morning services, three days a week, and sometimes a few times in the afternoon as well. In October 1549, the number of sermons increased from every other day to once a day by order of the city council in every church in Geneva through Calvin's influence. So Calvin, 
truly is an example of someone who preached in season and out of season. And that leads me to lesson number nine. Let us ever learn as preachers or as teachers or as church workers the value, the primacy of preaching, even during our busiest and most trying of times. And let us let no daily duty or problems or interference take away from preaching time and preparation for preaching. This is the apex of human life, to hear the word of God through the servant of God. This must always have priority. That was Calvin's conviction. And then finally, the years of support, 1555 to 1564, only nine years before he died, where the libertines voted out of office in the city council and a number of men replaced them so that Calvin finally had the majority of votes in favor of his reforms. And for the last nine years of his life, Calvin started not only Geneva Academy, but a number of other reforms as well. And... Uh, in those nine years, without all that opposition, he did so much of his writing and preached even more and was a wise counselor and a seasoned church leader. They were the nine happiest years he had in Geneva. He wrote most of his commentaries in those last nine years, which contain 45 volumes of 400 pages each covering 24 of the 39 Old Testament books and all but 2nd and 3rd John and Revelation of the New Testament. 75% of the scriptures. Philip Schaff says he's the king of the commentaries. He also wrote voluminous letters, thousands of letters from his study, from his sickbed, encouraging, instructing pastors, persecuted believers throughout Europe to persevere in the doctrines of grace. He sent men he trained for the ministry out to every European country and over to Brazil and would have sent it to other places had the Roman Catholic shipping lanes opened up for Reformed preachers as well. And as his ministers, his fellow ministers, gathered around him on his deathbed, as I said to you before, Calvin said to them after he asked for forgiveness, God has given me grace to write what I have written as faithfully as it was in my power, and I can say with freedom, I have never falsified a single passage of the scriptures, nor given it a wrong interpretation to the best of my knowledge. Lesson number 10. Let us learn with Calvin to respect the scriptures, preached, read, commented on, no matter what it costs us. We need to learn, like we heard from Huss, as well as from Calvin, to live sola scriptura. Now, counting his posthumous works, Calvin's collected writings fill 59 large folio volumes. In 1561, Theodore Beza, three years before Calvin died, claimed in a letter to Pharrell that over a thousand people were hearing Calvin preach on a daily basis. And Calvin himself said that preaching first of all, but also writing in the second place, was the means that God, were, God was using in Geneva and around the world to turn hearts to obedience, to confirm the faith of believers, and to build up and purify the church of Jesus Christ. Calvin's preaching, says Steve Lawson in his recent book on it, was biblical in its substance, sequential in its pattern, direct in its message, extemporaneous in its delivery, exegetical in its approach, accessible in its simplicity, pastoral in its tone, polemic in its defense of the truth, passionate in its outreach, and doxological in its conclusion. And I would just add experiential in its applications. You can scarcely exaggerate the influence of Calvin's sermons also on succeeding generations, even till today. And one of my personal dreams is that the several hundred sermons of Calvin that have still yet to be translated, that we would be able to have them translated and published uh, in the next generation. Calvin's last years were packed with all kinds of evangelistic endeavors, 
particularly in France, but even as far away as Brazil. And Geneva trained ministers and missionaries were planted in all kinds of churches in the Netherlands, Italy, Poland, Germany, Hungary, England, and Scotland. Everywhere, Calvin's advice was sought and gladly given. Calvin's death. During the last years of his life, Calvin battled numerous diseases. He refused to stop working, which brings me to lesson number 11. Let us remember that as valuable as good work is, we need to use reason. Let us work hard, but also know our physical boundaries and listen to our bodies when they give us distress signals. But ultimately, Calvin is about this. Soli Deo Gloria. That's his life. Calvin the reformer, Calvin the theologian, Calvin the pastor counselor, Calvin the churchman, Calvin the evangelist, Calvin the writer had one goal. He was a one-minded man, a single eye, thy name to glorify. Every area of his personal life, every area of his ministry, Calvin is wholly committed to God, to his glory. And he only yearned to promote the preeminence of Christ in dependency on the Holy Spirit. That's what gave Calvin his world view. Calvin propounded that our thinking, our speaking, our acting ought to be shaped by divine glory intentionally every day, every discipline, every duty, having God's glory in view. And he was consistent, amazingly consistent, not just in the so-called five points of Calvinism as it's called today, or the, the five solas, uh, yes, they all had a part in his theology, but Calvin's whole way of life was a living out of the doctrines he propounded, even though, yes, there were shortcomings, of course, but the influence of Calvin's Calvinism has been summarized by Burke Parsons as, quote, devotion, doctrine, and doxology. The heart's devotion to the biblical God the mind's pursuit of the biblical doctrine of God and the entire being's surrender to doxology to praise God. In conclusion, Calvin's greatest influence was in Britain and the North American colonies uh, initially, uh, as well as the Netherlands and Hungary and parts of Germany. And in all of these and many more areas around the globe, including Poland, Italy, Brazil, South Africa, uh, Malawi, Zambia, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, South Korea, China, the Philippines, Russia, Egypt, Pakistan, India, and Israel. And now today I can add to it, all of Latin America and Central America, Calvinism is still being pr propagated today and being revived. And in many places in the world today, there is a revival of the Reformed faith. Calvinism has a bright future, for it offers much to people who seek to believe and practice the whole counsel of God with clear-headed faith and warm-hearted hearted piety. So lesson number 12. Let us ever realize that genuine piety has far-reaching influences, and under the blessing of the Spirit, it can spread itself over the entire globe. You see, our walk talks more than our talk talks. And when we walk according to what we talk, there is power in it for God's servants not only, but also lay people. And so we are called as reformed people to let our light shine, to let the glory of God shine in us and through us despite all our struggles with indwelling sin. I close with this thought of Cotton Mather, the Puritan. He wrote, every night, he wrote this to John Cotton, another Puritan, every night when I go to bed, I sweeten my mouth with a piece of Calvin before I go to sleep. Because this man loved the glory of God. And so I pray that this spirit of genuine world and eternity embracing piety that so enveloped Calvin may also penetrate every one of us
as we contemplate his life, his legacy, and his lessons. And that we would, by the grace of God, strive to implement his God-glorifying worldview in our own family, our own generation, our own work, in dependency on the Holy Spirit, until the day comes that we will perfectly glorify our fatherly sovereign and his glorious son around the throne of the Lamb forever and ever without any sin and without any shortcoming. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank thee so much for the life of thy servant, John Calvin, impugned and ridiculed and criticized and fought against nearly his whole life long and yet steady, living for thy glory. Oh God, give us that courage. Give us that commitment. Give us that usefulness that we may live wholly and solely for thee and for thy glory. Help us to live in holy self-forgetfulness and to be used for the cause of Jesus Christ to the full. And do forgive all our self-centeredness, all our sin, all that would weigh us down. Oh God, have mercy upon us and lift us up above our puny little selves and consume us with thy glory that we might say with Jonathan Edwards, the best moments of my life have those in which I've wholly forgotten myself and been caught up with passion for the glory of the triune God. We pray in Jesus' name. 